live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Wednesday, January 15th, 2020. I think I'm back on the uh, proper uh, cadence for the year this time. Uh, hey, you know there's a little bit going on today. It turns out that there was a debate yesterday. If you were here to talk about the debate, welcome. I mean, just welcome. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm sure we'll mention it. It did happen. Well, and there you go. It's done. I've done it. Uh, Greg will probably have a little bit more, perhaps, to say about it. I, uh, I'm not in debate mode at this point. I'm never in debate mode, really, but I'm really just less than interested this time. Uh, my attention was elsewhere yesterday. Of course, uh, today is the day scheduled for, I think, that uh, Speaker Pelosi plans, well, planned anyway, before last night's news. We'll see whether it continues into today with these plans to bring measures to the floor to uh, name the House managers for the impeachment trial of Donald Trump, who purports to be the 45th president of the United States. Uh, And those managers, of course, will then be directed to carry over the articles of impeachment. One, both, I don't know, Uh, no indication of any more games uh, and they're good games, by the way. I don't mean to uh, to diminish their importance or impact by calling them games, but uh, no more, no indication of any more maneuvers in the offing with respect to whether or not the uh, both articles would be sent over. Although now would be a fine time to reconsider, and in fact, I think it would be a fine time to reconsider whether or not those measures come to the floor today. <clears throat> Given that last night. Uh, was the first look that the wider world got at the disclosed, voluntarily disclosed contents of Lev Parnas's phone and computers and email accounts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I guess uh, all of this stuff has been turned over to a judge and cleared by that judge for release to the House Intelligence Committee, reviewed, of course, then by the members of the House Intelligence Committee and released, um, was it the, yeah, I think it was the Intelligence Committee that coordinated the release. Uh, I have news sitting somewhere in pocket in the form of a release from the committee that it is their intention to forward all of this information uh, along with the articles of impeachment on its way over. So, you know, if they if they do stick with the plans to simply roll things out and uh, send it on, then, well, it will go as part of the evidence. And, of course, remember, senators are insistent that uh, no new evidence be introduced in the Senate, but that they contain themselves, the Republicans say, and they are in the majority. Uh, The design is for the Senate to contain its consideration to the record produced by the House. Well, this will be part of the record produced by the House. Now, there's more information to come, and we haven't seen that yet. And uh, a a lot of information has been released, but apparently, uh, Greg tells me he's got reporting that says it's a small portion of the amount of material handed over. There was an awful lot of material handed over. Uh, But this, even the small amount is, well, it's a little shocking. It's got uh, all kinds of fun and interesting Uh, international intrigue, and a local angle for Greg to investigate. Uh, New name for our rogues gallery of international intrigue and impeachment nomenclature, Robert F. Hyde, uh, who is now, currently, these days, uh, considers himself a candidate for congressional office in in Connecticut's 5th District, which is where where Greg is. So he'll be reporting from on the ground in Hyde's district. Um, we'll learn a lot about this guy, and we'll, we've learned a lot about him just from the materials being released. But now the backgrounders are coming out, uh, and he's, been a, he's a prolific uh, social media user. 
like all of the conspirators for some reason in the Donald Trump world, I guess because Trump had such success using social media, they all did it. They, they all started tying their ties too long and then they started moving into social media to try to be like Trump, <clears throat> which has only served as uh, documentation of their wrongdoing. <clears throat> uh, Hyde spent most of the night running around trying to erase most of his social media footprint, but of course, lots of it has already been captured and, and as it turns out, turned over to the authorities at some point. And uh, so we'll read a little bit about who this guy is and uh, what he's been up to. And that includes, uh, by the way, the background. He, he, has, he, he is a congressional candidate, or at least he was. I don't know whether he dropped out last night or anything like that. Uh, but seeking, I guess, uh, they haven't settled it yet. It's only January. The Republican nomination for Connecticut's 5th District uh, his, hasn't stopped him from identifying himself on Instagram, I think, is the social media service he's using under the name of Congressman Hyde, which is more than a little bit misleading. But uh, his social media feeds chock full of photos of him <clears throat> with Trump himself, with, I think, almost, er I guess, every one of the Trump children, save the one who should not be named. Um, and so, yes, it includes Tiffany. He's on the golf course. He's in Mar-a-Lago. He's in the White House. He's in Congress. He's at the hotel. He's at Doral. He's all over the place. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about his background, but... Uh, Suffice to say, this is about, I, I guess this is what would have happened to Joe the Plumber if he decided to stay in the public eye. He was apparently, you know, he's his, got a great background for running for Congress, a former landscaper turned wannabe lobbyist turned hanger on, turned uh, congressional candidate, turned maybe hitman. Uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a story. <laughs> we'll go over it. But first... Greg Dworkin, who says he's going to be voting for this guy, which is incredible. Can you explain yourself, Greg? Um, I'm well, lying. When did you stop voting for this guy? I, okay. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, this is an incredible character. And I'm sure, I, my guess is, nobody in the district knows who the hell the guy is. I mean, maybe his neighbors know him as a flamboyant character, but I don't get the sense that he's known. Uh, he's not known. So, but here's the deal in Connecticut. So we're talking about the fifth district here. This is Johanna Hayes district, a district previously uh, represented, uh, by the way, uh, by Elizabeth Esty, who has who had yes. to uh, uh, resign uh, because she wasn't forceful enough about uh, staff members mm -hmm. uh, yes, who uh, had abused people. Uh, but before that, Chris Murphy. Uh, so it's an interesting district. Before that. Uh, it was uh, Nancy Johnson, who was a Trumpy Republican, uh, because there are some rural areas in this district. So it's a swing district, but it generally votes like uh, two percent for the Democrats sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe. In any case, yes. um, uh, Hyde is hide. a uh, former uh, 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 military guy military. Uh, who actually uh, served a couple, I think, of uh, tours in. Uh, I don't know if it was Iraq or Afghanistan, but had an injury and, in fact, lost his hearing. So he always travels ah. with a service dog. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I've seen the dog. Right. So, uh, you know, he, he, it, it, but people like that, you know, it's really tough to tell whether he uh, just doesn't listen, which is a different issue oh. altogether. Mm. And, you know, part of the problem. Well, let, let's go back to the beginning here. Ukraine prosecutor offered information related to Biden in exchange for Ambassador's ouster newly released materials show. So as you mm -hmm. pointed out, this all came from Lev Parnas, released by his lawyer to the uh, House Intelligence Committee, who then released it to the press and prominently featured are a lot of exchanges with this fellow Hyde. Now, uh, uh, Natasha Bertrand was following this. And uh, let me give you a hide for U.S. Congress uh, tweet from November 15, 2019. All uh, right. He, he, he tweeted this while she was testifying. Yes. Okay. And uh, actually, I see Ooh. on his website, he's a U.S. Marine Corps Iraq veteran. Uh, so landscape. that clarifies right. where uh, he had his uh, combat injury. We elected President Trump to drain the swamp of traitors like this, talking about Yovanovitch. Maria uh -huh. is a huge POS 
She has so much mm. dirt on the Clintons and Biden, such a scumbag. And then the uh, this is his tweet. And then the uh, hashtags that drain the swamp. Maria is a traitor. Trump 2020. Hi, 2020. Yes. And I'm going to read some crude things because I think we have a tendency oh, to bowdlerize and whitewash some of this stuff and say, oh, he, he had a very vulgar tweet. But then you never really hear what he actually said and how mm. vulgar it was. Uh, it was bad. And I, I think you lose the impact. OK. And then you forget about it because, uh, you know, he said something bad. I forget what it was. So uh, we, we may, uh, right. just a uh, fair warning to our listeners, uh, cover this stuff not because we endorse this sort of language, but uh, because sometimes it's important to hear what the guy actually said. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah. uh, we have this uh, Yovanovitch, uh, Parnas, and Lusensko uh, 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 back and forth, where Yovanovitch, uh, in this uh, back and forth between Parnas and Lusensko, actually seems to be threatened. Yes. My uh, Zuchevsky matter is progressing well. There's testimony about transfers. And here you can't even get rid of one female fool. Uh And they come back as well. She's not a simple fool. Trust me. But she's not getting away. And uh, somehow or other, uh, Hyde gets pulled into all of that. And uh, Bradley Moss, who's interesting because uh, he is of the uh, law firm that represents whistleblowers, says, so we learned today about the apparent security threat to Ivanovich. The threat was coming from the president's own henchmen. They're stalking her and getting price quotes and other services. Mm-hmm. Now, Hyde involved in this. Hyde is 40 years old, a resident of Simsbury, and a Republican who's running for Congress in Connecticut's 5th District, a relative unknown who hopes to unseat Re- Representative Johanna Hayes. Hyde made headlines last month after he posted a sexist and vulgar tweet about California Senator Kamala Harris. And again, warning, this is very vulgar. Mm-hmm. And most people don't t- say, they just said, it's a vulgar tweet and we won't even repeat it. But I'm going to repeat it because I think you need to hear what this guy says and who right. he is. On December 3rd, Careful. after Harris suspended her presidential campaign, Hyde posted this on Twitter, went down, brought to her knees, blew it. Hyde tweeted, must be a hard one to swallow. Kamala Harris heals up. ha. Uh-huh. He's, right? he's a, and then well, in May, a uh, Hyde was removed by police from Trump National Doral, Miami, in Florida. Mm-hmm. According to an incident report filed by the Doral Police Department, Hyde told the responding officer he was in fear for his life and a hitman was out to get him. Isn't that Hyde gave police with a variety of names and contacts to provide information about why he felt his life was in danger. He wasn't arrested. Police accord- escorted him from the hotel, transported him to an undisclosed location, in the vehicle, Hyde said his computer had been hacked by the Secret Service, and the Secret Service were watching him at the premises, according to the incident report. Yes. That undisclosed okay. location, uh, I can't disclose the location because I don't know it, but uh, apparently, according to other reporting, uh, a facility in which he was placed under mental health watch for several days. Hyde donated at least $2,000 to Trump's re-election fund and at least $750 to the Connecticut Republican Party while owing the mother of his 13-year-old son more than $2,000 in child support, according to court records. He runs a so-called PR business, public relations business, and what he does is he takes pictures of himself, as you pointed out, with the Trump children and then says, here how influential I am, here's my Instagram. Uh, But it's unclear exactly what business is business does. It's not registered with the PR firms in D.C. and nobody's heard of him. And every time he says, well, I did this work for this person or that work for that person. And you contact them, they say, I don't know who he is. There's no yeah. record of him ever doing anything like that. There's for a us. lot of those people around uh, Trump for some reason. It's not the first such story we've heard. Right. So, uh, you know, he's a very odd bird, to say the least. Now, yes. the way it works in Connecticut politics is that the party doesn't typically dictate and perhaps this has uh, relevance to the national uh, primary with Democrats, the party doesn't dictate who the candidate is. This may come as some shock to people who think everything is rigged, but that's not how it works in Connecticut. In August, there'll be a primary, and whoever the winner is is the one who runs against Johanna Hayes. So the party doesn't determine who the candidate is, and the party doesn't determine who runs. So the party is not in a position to say, oh, you can't run for Congress because you're a jerk and a dirtbag and things that are even worse than what you said in your vulgar tweet. They can't. All they can say is, we suggest he withdraw. We withhold support. We are not endorsing him. But that's about all they can do. And that's what they've done. And after that tweet, the Republican Party in Connecticut basically washed their hands of him. But Mm -hmm. they're not in a position to say, you can't run. So he gets to say, I'm running for Congress. I don't care what these people say. I'm a fighter. I'm Trumpy. Yes. 
In fact, and that's uh, the situation. I guess Instagram has nothing to say about him saying he's the congressman right now. Yeah. I don't know why so, they don't. So that's the story. So, uh, you know, I, whether he's an associate of Giuliani or not, you know, you get the impression that uh, he sort of hung out and gave some money, not enough to uh, get to be an ambassador, but enough to at least attract attention. And then uh, when they needed a go-between, you know, it would be irresponsible not to speculate. We don't know this part. But you wonder, since he has pictures of himself and Kevin McCarthy, you know, mm-hmm. it would be irresponsible to speculate whether or not there's any Russian money involved in any of this. And somehow or other, he's some kind of conduit. Yeah, I mean, there's really no reason not to. Uh, basically, if Kevin McCarthy... No, we have no information, but why does he have pictures of Kevin McCarthy and Lev Parnas? Oh, he's got pictures galore. I mean, it's incredible what pictures he's got. Uh, Kevin McCarthy says he forgets every connected person he ever meets. I mean, including the prime minister of Ukraine when he came to town to tell him what the Russians were up to. He forgot all about that, too. Uh, he's con- his constant excuse is that he doesn't know who these people are. But that's uh, he learned that from Trump. Trump now. Uh, tells right, exactly. Everybody, you know, so, Giuliani's you know, he, a he, coffee. He, the guy doesn't seem smart enough to learn anything by himself. So no. he just uh, imitates people. But that's what he's doing. So this is from the uh, Connecticut Insider from the News Times, which mm-hmm. is part of the Hearst chain. Uh, it's behind a paywall, so the oh. raw story piece that I was reading to you isn't, but this part is. It says, appears Hyde worked with Parnas to monitor the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich's monitor. movements in Ukraine as a campaign unfolded to remove her from her post. Yes. The text suggests that Hyde worked with the Ukrainian team to track Ivanovich, possibly with the goal of interfering with her work in some fashion. If you that want her murder. out, they need to make contact with security forces, Hyde wrote to Parnas on March 26, 2019. They're willing to help if we you would like a price, hmm. I wrote in one chilling message. Guess you could do anything in Ukraine with money, what I was told. Now, Hearst Connecticut Media first reported Hyde's relationship with Parnas, his associate Igor Fruman, and the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, in November of 2019. Parnas recently turned over thousands of new documents to House impeachment investigators, and that's where this stuff is coming from. Yeah. Hyde's been a generous Republican donor. He's been photographed with Trump on multiple occasions. He's also been photographed with Pence. Kevin McCarthy and other GOP members. Yeah, all of them. Really, right? He's, I'll tell you. I did not immediately respond to a request for comment you. on Tuesday, but then, of course, he tweeted. And uh, I saw you had uh, covered that, making disparaging remarks about Adam Schiff for some reason. Uh, yes. Because, that's you know, uh, if nothing else now. works. Let's go at least anti-Semitic. Right. Uh, my big hero has, calls him a pencil neck, so I'm going to make fun of him, too. Uh, also, he has maybe power of life and death over me all of a sudden, and I hate that. Right. Often with this ser- service dog Thunder, this is from a different uh, uh, post. Hyde attended fairs and political meetings around Connecticut. Uh, and uh, I'm just trying to read if there's anything really of interest. All I know is that everybody who gave him money says I never heard of him. <laughs> uh you know yeah. it's one of those oh That's i never heard of this yeah. i never heard of trump i had uh, nothing right. to do with that i didn't vote for him i wasn't his campaign manager i i didn't uh, have all these pictures with me and i don't you're making this stuff up yes uh sure you're all under arrest though right just saying uh okay yeah so like as i said uh there's there's a whole mess of pictures that this guy has been running around trying to delete along the way uh, with every member of the Trump family and, and multiple. With Trump, he's he's there every day. He's at the right. golf course. He's at Mar-a-Lago. He's every place. Right. So the Hill hmm. tried to get a comment from this guy, uh, Robert Hyde. And oh, uh, as their report says, and again, I don't love the Hill, but again, it's not behind a paywall like most of the Connecticut papers are. The Republican hey, candidate up, dismissed the documents released by Democrats on Tuesday, what bullshit. <laughs> Adam Schiffhead is a poor losing POS, Hyde wrote in a text to the Hill. Mm-hmm. That was his answer. Okay. So you get an idea who this guy is. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's a real. Uh, <laughs> he's, yeah. Well, maybe he's not he's a, a real character. character. Maybe That's he's a fake. Say, right? Yeah, uh, he might be a fake character, though. Right. I mean, it's that. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of people, you know, it's it's really tough to make this stuff up. So so that's yeah. the background yeah. to all of this. Now, how much is this really going to make a difference? Probably not much. A, a uh, Jonathan Bernstein writing in his newsletter, the new documents released by House Democrats on Tuesday exposing previously unknown details about efforts by Trump associates to obtain material in Ukraine 
that would undermine Trump's Democratic opponents probably doesn't change anything. Whether evidence emerges is unlikely to change either the trial outcome or its effect on public opinion, but it certainly has to worry House Republicans who have already voted to support Trump and Senate Republicans expecting to vote to acquit him at least a little bit, because if new ugly details are still emerging, who's to say more won't turn up later? And it also gives you an idea of what sort of documents they're trying to hide. So all of that's true. And, uh, you know, he, he goes further on to make uh, a further point about um, it's not really going to make too much difference uh, to the Iowa uh, caucuses that Warren Klobuchar and Sanders will be uh, pulled off the trail. What might make a difference is on the one hand, uh, media is going to be focused on impeachment. And on the other, uh, Warren Klobuchar and Sanders won't be in Iowa to manage uh, on the ground personally a late search. Yes. So sure. therefore, uh, impeachment may have the effect of freezing everything in place. And in place means it's not really clear who's ahead. Mm -hmm. That's true. A uh, big mystery how that will affect things and what's coming out of Iowa. Uh, I don't know whether we're supposed to sort it out based on what happened last night, but it didn't help me any. No. Well, you know, again, that's not really something that happened. Let's let's just throw in that so we can dispose of it. I, I watched about, I would say, three quarters of it. I saw some of these so-called bigger moments. You know, it was a, basically it was a it was a fine debate. There were people on the stage who belonged there. They started off with foreign policy, which was a good thing. Biden wasn't hurt by it. Buttigieg wasn't helped by it. The Warren Sanders showdown didn't turn out to be much of a showdown until after the debate was over. And people were speculating she wouldn't shake his hand. Uh, you know, it's, it, that's a non-substantive, substantive kind of uh, comment that really, I don't know, has any effect. Here's Alex Rorty writing for McClatchy, who I think has a pretty clear-eyed view of it. Few fireworks, plenty of substance as candidates offer respectful policy differences rather than personal attacks. Foreign policy gets its due. Biggest moment was Warren arguing why she and women generally can beat Trump. Uh, and uh, I thought that was good. Jennifer Taub reminded us on Twitter, for example, that Nancy Pelosi is cleaning Trump's clocks. They don't give us this nonsense mm. about what women can do. Uh, and then Rorty goes on to say, did the debate change the racist trajectory, even with so many undecided voters? Unlikely. Also, feels as if the field has all internalized less than that going negative hasn't worked for some formal rivals. Going after Biden directly is like doesn't work. It's not what voters want. I think secretly they suspect he might be the nominee and they don't want him damaged. But for whatever reason, it's just not working. Hmm. Combined with runaway front runner, uh, with no runaway front runner, no. that's how you get a debate that feels as if it took place in September rather than January. Hmm. So things are frozen in place. And then we have, I think, in three weeks, the, uh, the actual caucuses where it's not clear who's going to win because, you know, uh, there may be several winners or it may be close, but we'll see. Yes. All right. All right, back to impeachment here. Uh, and this is going to be something of an abbreviated uh, roundup. I'm going to be done at the half hour, but I'll get everything in no, that I wanted just... to get in. So that at least there's that. This is from an interesting article by Paul Kane in The Washington Post. Interesting for those of you who like process. Hmm. Pomp and procession, then Trump impeachment trial begins in earnest. OK. All right. A vote later Wednesday today will formally transmit the two articles of impeachment to the Senate, a procession that will cert will come almost exactly four weeks after the House first voted. Pelosi's impeachment managers will line up and bring the articles across the Capitol and into the Senate chamber. And this is uh, 1999, January 7th, 1999. Either take your seats or go to the cloakroom, Senator Strom Thurmond said banging a gavel to tell senators to make way for the House managers. I wonder make if that way. will be on TV. Thurmond, yes. who retired in 2003 and died soon after leaving office, served as the Senate's president pro tempore, ordering the managers to follow behind James Ziegler, the Senate sergeant at arms at the time. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment while the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States Articles of impeachment, said the sergeant at arms. OK. That's what to watch for. And I guess the point of saying all that, besides the fact that it's always fascinating. Yeah. Knowing what it means when you see a mace on the wall or not, you know, that, that kind of stuff's interesting. But as people who participated in the Clinton impeachment said from the Senate point of view, the uh, somber pomp and circumstance actually 
formalizes and makes it like feel like it's important. Yes, that's true. And Supposed and so when you see all of that, when you see the sergeant at arms, if you're watching that, it's like, okay, this is real. This isn't, isn't just like <clears throat> fake news stuff. Yeah. Well, all right. Uh, that's true. It uh, you, You'll get to see a little ceremony. It's it's always fun and interesting. You'll probably see it on C-SPAN. Uh, the footage of this procession from 1999 is, is on C-SPAN in their archives. I've seen it circulated in the last couple of days. Uh, just for a moment, just to point out to you, uh, for the Republicans boo-hooing about uh, Pelosi's massive delay in delivering these things, uh, you heard Greg read to you that it was, what would you say, uh, January... 7th. No, January 7th, 1999, that this processional took place. The impeachment in the House, of course, was December 19th, 1998. Sounds awfully familiar, don't you think? This unprecedented event of Nancy Pelosi just upending the Constitution. She should be arrested, I tell you, for delaying the articles of impeachment. Uh, they were passed on December 19th and delivered on January 7th. These were passed on December 18th of last year and will be delivered, uh, I guess, January 15th, maybe 16th. Uh, huge difference, uh, world-shaking, uh, un undoing of the Constitution she's perpetrated here. Right. So uh, Jonathan Bernstein throws in one last thing, that Pelosi and the Democrats lose a showdown with Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, as Chris Saliza says. Nah. Oh, okay. That's good because, yeah, Chris Salitza was pretty sure uh, and uh, we couldn't she, be followed you know, up worse. She got a little, including this left partner stuff and, and Bolton willing to testify, and she lost nothing. Pretty much. Uh, but reasons, blah, 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 what kind of beer would it be? And everybody needs to know uh, for about a million dollars a year what Chris Salitza has to say about that stuff. All right. So you say you got to go, eh? We'll Gotta allow go. it. Okay, hear ye, hear ye. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, right? yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that Kegro in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, man, there's an awful lot uh, that came out last night, and we want to cover most of that. And I don't know if there's any real organized way of doing it. Uh, let me, uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll start because it's here. With this Mother Jones piece, which, though a relatively late entrant uh, in in my news feed anyway, uh, seems to sum up a lot of what I put away last night, so that I think will be helpful. David Korn wrote this up for Mother Jones. New figure in Ukraine scandal was taken into police custody at Trump Resort last year. You heard Greg mention it. There's slightly more detail in this one, and uh, you get the picture from um, uh, the subheader here. This landscaper turned lobbyist, and it's not that that can't be done, it's just unusual. This landscaper turned lobbyist claimed the Secret Service and a hitman were after him. Now, I, I want you to keep in mind, I might have perhaps done this in reverse order, but I think that probably most of you heard early in this cycle of this story about why... Uh, why believing that a hitman was after you might be important. But in case we, uh, in case you missed it, I guess we should uh, point out, <clears throat> and we'll make the long story short, some of, uh, some portion of the materials turned over 
by Lev Parnas the other day. I forget exactly when he turned them over, but the ones released last night include uh, the contents of uh, several WhatsApp text messaging sessions between, uh, well, between a lot of people, but at least one of them between Hyde and Lev Parnas, in which it appears for all the world as though Hyde, well, it sounds at first like Hyde himself, but later on, I guess some additional context tells us that Hyde, I guess, uh, has allegedly hired other people in Ukraine to do this work, and that he may not be in Ukraine, but he's getting live updates or something. It's not entirely clear how he's getting this information or whether he's getting the information, I guess. You know, he might possibly simply be making it all up. But the text messages make it sound for all the world as if Hyde has someone, and it's surmised to be, from circumstantial evidence elsewhere, surmised to be Marie Yovanovitch, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, under physical surveillance And the discussion about this surveillance hints very strongly at the possibility that they are planning to intervene violently in some fashion, perhaps, in what she's doing that day. And what it looks like is it looks like they're tracking her movements and getting set to either kidnap or murder her. That's that's what it looks like, period. The end. You can spin it all you want, but that's what it looks like. And you think, well, that's crazy. I mean, it is, right? That can't possibly be what they're doing here. Uh, No one would ever attempt such a thing. It's insane to believe it's even a possibility. But, well, there it is. Is, This is what these texts look like. And uh, I wonder, let's see, if any of the various... Uh, articles that I put aside have got copies of these things, but uh, certainly lots of the texts being, or screenshots of the texts being circulated yesterday via Twitter make it fairly clear. And and I guess in case you haven't read any of them, I, I feel like perhaps I ought to scan around and try and find some of them, but I don't know whether I was retweeting them yesterday or not. Uh, I'll tell you what, Though I do have this handy uh, from Congressman, an actual Congressman, Don Beyer, uh, right here in Virginia, has, well, I guess was so stunned that he tweeted the thing around. Here's a, der- he says, deranged tweet from one of the men at the center of the bombshell communications just released, which revealed threatening behavior directed at Ambassador Marie Ivanovich. And again, this is the one <clears throat> that uh, Greg mentioned, pardon me, <clears throat> in which, uh, uh, he calls her, this is from, from Robert Hyde, calls her a traitor, and uh, we elected President Trump to drain the swamp, remember, of traitors like this. Maria is a huge, and he spells it Y-U-G-E, huge P-O-S. Uh, she has so much dirt on the Clintons and Bidens, such a scumbag. I mean, there, first of all, let me ask you this. In what universe, in November of last year, does a Connecticut congressional candidate, landscaper turned lobbyist turned congressional candidate, have that much information on Marie Yovanovitch and feel that strongly about the necessity of her removal. There are very, very few Republicans uh, at that point who are outside of Congress, and he is outside of Congress despite the fact that he bills himself as a congressman on Instagram, uh, who have that kind of uh, feeling about anybody in the in the State Department, for one thing, but about Marie Ivanovich in particular. Even Pete Sessions, who actively campaigned for her removal, doesn't speak of her in these terms. And it's just not a widely known thing, not even among the right-wing conspiracy theorists who, you know, are, are often seem to have weird fixations about people. Uh, he's been fed information about, you know, false information about Jovanovic from Lev Parnas. And that's how he comes to these kinds of insane conclusions. Uh, so included in his insane tweet of November is a, I guess he's got a meme 
piece. By that point, uh, I guess he's he's borrowing meme memed information from the right wing nutosphere, and so he's got this photo of Jovanovic with little bullet points, uh, all the things that are supposed to be evil about her, including the the lie that she gave a do not prosecute list to Lutsenko. Uh, what did you have here? Colluded with Hillary Clinton and the DNC to undermine the 2016 election. Um, you know, works with George Soros. Used her position to unlawfully spy on U.S. conservatives, journalists in the Trump administration, uh, which is just, I mean, as classic as uh, the projection gets. But, yeah, where is uh, some of these... I'm trying to find some of these uh, text messages. Here we are. Natasha Bertrand. I think was the first one that I saw tweeting these things around and uh, her first salvo of them in which she says, um, holy S word here. This certainly makes it sound like Parnas and company were actively tracking Jovanovich's movements. This could explain why Jovanovich was moved out of Ukraine so quickly. And I thought that made it perfectly clear but apparently she felt that needed further clarification and I'm glad to have it. And she said, here's a flashback. She's going to go through some things. Trump said of Jovanovich during his call with Zelensky. And she gives a hat tip to Amanda Carpenter for remembering that comment. I thought that was clear from the, why she was moved out of Ukraine so quickly. But if you don't recall all of the testimony that she gave, uh, and all of the, um, the the recounting of the circumstances of her removal that were revealed. She was not only removed from her position very quickly and summarily, but was moved essentially under threat. They they called her in the middle of the night and said, you need to get out of Ukraine and you need to get out of here now, like the next plane out of here. And Jovanovich was saying, you know, am I in danger? And they just said, you just put it this way. You got to get out of here right away. And... So, you know, it hinted at physical danger, but without much to follow up with, everybody just thought, well, it's a dark hint, but it doesn't tell us much more about what's actually going on here. Maybe it's just weird speculation. But again, Natasha has these emails or or these uh, WhatsApp uh, texts here. Let me uh, let me open it all up and. And make it all make sure that it's all pocketed so that it's easy for me to find for you later on. Uh, so here's some screenshots of the <clears throat> the conversation, and uh, I guess the texts here noted in blue appear to be the ones coming from Hyde. And it starts out this way: She's talked to three people. Her phone is off. Computer off. Again, we don't yet know who the her is. But then the next text is, she's next to the embassy. Not in the embassy is the next text uh, with about uh, just a few seconds separating all this. So this is all one quick conversation here. Not in the embassy. Private security. Been there since Thursday. He's just casually noting about the U.S. ambassador. Parnas answers here, just interesting. And you'll note that most of the talking going on here is Hyde and Parnas is just sort of, uh, you know, keep going, sort of participating just enough to get Hyde to keep talking, which is weird and questionable all by itself. Uh, Hyde does continue. Update. She will not be moved. Special security unit upgraded force on the compound. And he he uses no punctuation, so it's very difficult. You're going to have to parse this. I'm trying to parse it as I'm reading it here. Update. She will not be moved. Special security unit upgraded force on the compound. People are already aware of the situation. My contacts are asking what is the next step because they cannot keep going to check. People will start to ask questions. It's starting to sound a little darker. Next. If you want her out, they need to make contact with security forces. Hmm. And then uh, the next set of texts here begins by saying, from Ukrainians, what's the word, bro? Any good stuff? I don't even know what the hell that's supposed to mean. More conversation. That address I sent you checks out. It's next to the embassy. 
And then the rather chilling, they are willing to help if we slash you would like a price. Guess you can do anything in the Ukraine. Wrong. In the Ukraine with money. What I was told, which prompts the first reaction in a while from Parnas, LOL. Update. She will not be moved. Then the special security message, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they will let me know when she's on the move. And they'll let me know. Oh, well, that says it, says it twice, basically. Two separate uh, texts. One, they will let me know when she's on the move. And then when it says, and they'll let me know when she's on the move. Perfect is the answer. I mean, where if they can find out? Hmm. I guess where she's moving to. Uh, I see. So I guess that's what they'll let me know when she's on the move and they'll let me know where she's going if they can find out when she's on the move. Okay, so I mean, it's a very weird, suspicious, dark stuff and it makes you wonder what would this guy be doing and why has he why has he uh, uh, hired some people or whatever to follow her? and find out what her movements are and it's you know dark and worrisome but right now at this point of course none of them are saying and i'm so glad that donald trump told me to track her so that we can kill her and even lev parnas is just sort of gamely going along and apparently at this point in the game uh let's see did i see uh this brought up somewhere i guess uh, this morning, Parnas and his lawyers are attempting to distance themselves from these texts, which is interesting because they provided these texts. I'm not sure what to make of this, but here again, uh, we'll warn you, just like with John Bolton's purported willingness to testify, I have my doubts, and it's not a great position to be in to be depending on an operator like Lev Parnas for being a reliable witness. Um, so that's the downside of some of uh, getting a held of some of this information and investing too much with it. Let's see. I have Greg Walters here, a uh, journalist with Vice News, whose tweet has been retweeted with comment by New York City NYC Southpaw. Walters tweet from uh, not all that long ago, I guess 32 minutes ago, says, new from Lev Parnas's lawyer, we completely categorically deny that Lev was involved in any activities with Hyde to surveil the ambassador and try to harm the ambassador. We believe Mr. Hyde's activities to be a reflection of his dubious mental state. NYC Southpaw's uh, commentary, and we did hear a little bit about his dubious mental state from the piece I'll read you from David Korn. Southpaw says this raises a question of why Lev Parnas was filling the inbox of a person with a dubious mental state with a stream of critical articles, tweets, and videos about specific U.S. ambassador to Central Europe, a specific, and this would be uh, Marie Ivanovich. And by November fifteenth, we see he's fully bought into the theories about how Yovanovitch is an arch enemy of all things Republican and or Trump, including being in cahoots with the evil George Soros. So that's uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure what Lev Parnas's lawyer means here by saying we completely deny that Lev was involved in any of the activities. Uh, I, I mean, is it not? the case that Lev Parnas is the other party to this conversation? Is that what they're trying to say? I mean, he is sort of standoffish in the conversation. And it it does come through, arguably, that he may think that Hyde is either full of it or crazy or just, I don't want anything to do with this necessarily. It's possible, one possible reading of all this. But to distance yourself from it entirely after you were the one who, A, had the conversation and, B, disclosed the conversation. Um, there's some more explaining you're going to need to have to, to give us here in order for us to buy into that. Anyway, back to Mother Jones and David Korn's piece here. New figure in Ukraine scandal was taken into police custody at Trump Resort last year. On Tuesday evening, that was yesterday, The House Intelligence Committee released a new batch of documents relating to the Ukraine scandal, and the material introduced a new player, Robert F. Hyde, 
a minor Republican lobbyist, he is not one, and avid Donald Trump supporter, he is one of those, who is mounting an against-the-odds congressional campaign in Connecticut. The 40-year-old Hyde is a curious figure. This is a lot of uh, speaking in euphemism here. <clears throat> in recent years, he has donated tens of thousands of dollars to Trump and Republicans as he has tried to establish himself as a Washington, D.C. lobbyist and public affairs operator. The former owner of a landscaping company, he was arrested in 2011 after his firm's work led to a tree falling on power lines, according to Connecticut Insider. He has said the charges were later dropped and he paid a fine. It can happen. His Facebook, Instagram, and website pages feature a parade of photos of him posing with Trump and other notable Republicans, including Ivanka Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, Representative Jim Jordan, now convicted felon Roger Stone, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, which is interesting, again, because Ron DeSantis turns up in all of this stuff. He's really got to be insanely corrupt. But in order just to keep turning up in all these photos, Parnas and Fruman are all over the place with him. But those guys live in Florida, right? Uh, this guy is from Connecticut. But weirdly, he has a fairly significant Florida presence which is also highly questionable. But there's DeSantis and all this. Uh, I have seen that Justice Putnam, I think, is circulating a picture that he saw in, in, just in response to what I was saying earlier. Uh, I had actually said that he, he's got pictures with all the Trump kids except for the one who shall not be named, including Tiffany. And I had seen the Tiffany one. But if you haven't, it's uh, circulating right now, thanks to Justice Putnam and uh, I guess the sleuths who first dug it up and shared it with everybody. So thanks very much, Justice, so that everybody can see that, just to see how uh, comprehensive his photo collection is, I guess. A financial disclosure form, Korn continues, that Hyde filed as a congressional candidate, he actually filed this thing, notes that he did public relations work for a mysterious Trump donor from China whom he once introduced Trump to at Mar-a-Lago. What? Mysterious Trump donors from China at Mar-a-Lago. What? I never heard of such a thing. Uh, and we've got a piece on that too. But for right now, we'll continue on. In November, he texted a reporter for CT or Connecticut, I think, insider. Could be conspiracy theory insider. I don't know. Pictures of himself with Rudy Caludi Giuliani and two Giuliani associates who have been indicted. Those are, of course, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman. It is Hyde's connection to Parnas that has landed him in the news. And a 2019 police report obtained by Mother Jones suggests that Hyde might have been a peculiar choice for Parnas to work with on his Giuliani-led Ukrainian op. The report notes that Hyde had a disturbing episode at a Trump resort for which he had been taken into custody by police and brought to a medical facility under a state law that allows for involuntary confinement of people who might pose a risk to themselves. Hmm. The new documents, which were provided to Congress this week by Parnas, raise the possibility that Giuliani's pursuit of dirt on Joe Biden in Ukraine, a project in which he was assisted by Parnas and Fruman, two Florida businessmen who were each born in the Soviet Union, was somehow connected to an effort to help Ukrainian oligarch Dmitro Firtash escape a U.S. indictment that alleged he had engaged in bribery. Furtash now resides in Vienna, where he is fiercely fighting extradition to the United States. Uh, that, of course, coming with the help of uh, Victoria Tensing and Joe de Geneva, who figure in this story as well. The cash also included text messages from late March 2019 between Hyde and Parnas, in which Hyde appears to be saying he was secretly monitoring the whereabouts of Marie Ivanovich, then the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, whom Parnas, Fruman, and Giuliani had been trying to get fired. And again, uh, the circle of people who uh, knew that Yovanovitch would be of interest to conspiracy-minded, right-wing, white nationalist-tied Trump world in March of 2019 was extremely small. That was just not a topic of conversation, even among the right-wing conspiracy mongers and meme makers in March of 2019. 
small group, small, tiny group of people who knew anything about Yovanovitch in March of 2019. To spend your time monitoring her whereabouts is uh, remarkable, to say the least. Okay, so um, the messages from Hyde had a dark tone. One ran, read, it's confirmed we have a person inside. Another text from Hyde to Parna said, guess you can do anything in Ukraine with money. We read those. The texts do not show what exactly Hyde was referencing, and his public record does not hold clues as to what influence or connections he might have had in Ukraine. Reached by Mother Jones after the texts were released, Hyde would not explain the messages or say how he had hooked up with Parnas. NBC News reported that Yovanovitch is now calling for an investigation of whether her movements in Ukraine were monitored by Hyde. I'd want to know, too. It's not clear if Hyde had any other involvement in the Ukraine scandal or any other Parnas capers. Parnas was indicted with Fruman in October for allegedly violating campaign finance law by making illegal donations to Republican candidates as part of a scheme to remove Yovanovitch at the request of one or more Ukrainian officials. I think that's actually very limiting in what they were trying to do by making all of these donations. But weeks after Hyde sent these texts to Parnas, he was involved in a bizarre incident at one of Trump's properties. Now, we'll get to that information and in, in that incident in a second. I just want to point out at this point that, uh, as they say, it's not clear if Hyde had any other involvement in other Parnas capers. And then it reminds you that one of the Parnas capers was, along with Igor Fruman, to rustle up as much cash as they could from various sources, dubious or otherwise, and give it to various Republican uh, candidates, super PACs, etc., and basically buy their way into the high-rolling Republican donor circuit and thereby uh, get themselves in position to have pictures taken with influential people, which could be used any number of ways, including, uh, one, uh, compromising their positions, two, uh, demonstrating uh, some level of purported influence that might get them uh, further investment or even... Uh, get them paid as lobbyists or influence peddlers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or get them the business contacts that they needed in order to make a killing in liquid natural gas exports to Ukraine, what have you. You're not sure exactly uh, which, if any, or maybe all of those aims they were pursuing at the same time with those photos. But although it's not clear whether Hyde was connected in any other Parnas capers, we should note that for whatever weird reason, Hyde, too, spent the same period of time gathering up as much cash as he could from any sources, dubious or otherwise, while owing thousands of dollars in child support to his ex-wife, etc., etc., and donating all of that money to Republican candidates and super PACs and putting himself in the high-roller Republican donor fundraiser picture-taking circuit and doing exactly the same thing that Parnas and Fruman were doing by way of getting themselves inside and making themselves look like connected people. We don't know why they were doing it. We don't know why he was doing it. We only know that the two of them were doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, but we don't know. I mean, I'm not criticizing Corn here. They're being careful. We don't know if they were connected with any other Parnas capers. Yes, we do. Okay. That's me putting my, taking uh, someone else's journalist hat, because I'm not, a, don't consider myself a journalist, and putting it over my mouth and saying, we know for sure that he was totally doing the same thing. Of course they were involved together. Now, what about that weird incident? According to an incident slash investigation report filed by the Doral, Florida Police Department on May 16th, 2019, this would be three months after watching Yovanovitch move around in Kiev. An officer was dispatched to the Trump National Doral, Miami, to deal with a male in distress fearing for his life. Remember, this is a landscaper turned lobbyist turned congressional candidate from Connecticut who's just playing golf in Miami in middle of the week. Uh, what's Well, I don't know what May 16th is. Somebody looked that up. We don't have time before the break, but maybe over the break I'll check it out. So, who was this man in distress fearing for his life? It was Hyde. 
The report noted that Hyde explained to the police officer that he was, quote, in fear for his life, was set up, and that a hitman was out to get him. Mr. Hyde spoke about emails he sent that may have placed his life in jeopardy. Mr. Hyde explained several times that he was paranoid and that some, or rather, he was paranoid that someone was out to get him. Uh, you know, sort of standard mental health kind of a thing, I'm sure, for the Doral Police Department. They've probably run into that sort of thing before. But I just wanted to note for the record, what kind of person were they talking about? What, who, what kind of person are we talking about was spending their time in March of 2019 uh, allegedly surveilling this high-level target, the U.S. ambassador in Ukraine? Well, we know this. That person later on, their thoughts when they got paranoid ran to being chased by a hitman, which we sometimes think of as uh, projection. But I suppose there's room for mental illness in there as well. It just so happens that his own delusions ran to being followed by a hitman, maybe because he had suggested it to himself by following the U.S. ambassador as though he were a hitman. I don't know for sure. We can't know his motivations. The report stated that Hyde cited a variety of different names, contacts, and actually all this information I think was from the Connecticut Insider as well. So Korn is quoting the same stuff that Greg read to us earlier. A little extra information here. Mr. Hyde continued to act paranoid, telling us, the police, not to stop next to certain vehicles. What do you think about that? He explained that he was scared due to several painting workers and landscape workers, and he's got experience with landscape workers, trying to do him harm because they weren't working. Additionally, Mr. Hyde explained that his computer was being hacked by the Secret Service and then went on further to explain that the Secret Service, uh, and for some reason this is just transcribed badly, the Secret Service was a rival, I guess had arrived, on the premises watching him. <clears throat> the police report said it was determined that Mr. Hyde was suffering from a redacted something incident, uh, that he was transported to a redacted location for further evaluation and that a crisis form was filled and filed. The report classified the incident as a Baker Marchman Act. We'll tell you what that's about after this. Welcome back now to the Cake on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I almost forgot to come back as I was uh, checking everything out here, trying to uh, uh, figure out exactly where we might head next. But I think we'll just continue on with... David Korn's article, I had mentioned to you the police report about uh, this guy Hyde being escorted out from the Miami Doral Trump Golf Club, uh, described or classified the incident as a Baker slash Marchman Act. Now, just by way of explanation, it says here in Florida, the Baker Act and the Marchman Act allow for holding people who might harm themselves involuntarily for assessment. The Baker Act specifically refers to persons who might be suffering from a mental illness. The report did not say what happened with Hyde after he was transported to the redacted location, but Hyde posted a note on Instagram stating that he had been Baker Acted for nine days and placed in a facility where his mental, emotional, and physical self were pushed. He's not a doctor. We don't know what he's talking about. He noted that he had passed all medicals, physicals, psych exams, and diagnoses. How do you pass a diagnosis? With flying colors. Like Trump says he did, because he knows which one is a camel, right? Hyde, a former Marine, also wrote, I'm not a traitor or a colluder or a conspiracy theorist, which should generally be taken to mean He's a traitor and a colluder and a conspiracy theorist. But he also added F-U, and he wrote that out, E-F-F, E-F-F-U, Y-O-U, and your intelligence agencies or whatever or whoever was or is effing with me. He's ready for Congress. Asked about the police report in this episode, Hyde did not comment. On Tuesday night, he tweeted, These are bad people. I'm out to expose their actions. Attack me all you want. Get the facts first. Have we heard this sort of act before? Please. I mean, all right. Uh, the media is against me because they're either complicit or have a hand in it, which is what complicit means. Or I welcome an investigation. 
I'll provide my email password and hand my phone over. Bring it on. Okay, we'll take it. Hyde is one of several Republicans, by the way, vying to challenge incumbent Johanna Hayes in Connecticut's 5th District. Last month, prominent Republicans called on him to quit the race after he posted a crude and sexist tweet about Senator Kamala Harris. We heard about that one. Hyde's involvement in the still murky Ukraine scandal adds another layer of mystery to the affair. Moreover, the release of the new Parnas documents shows that even as the impeachment case heads toward the Senate for trial, there is much about Trump's and Giuliani's Ukrainian skullduggery that remains unknown. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty mild way of putting it. It's true. Uh, let's see. What other items might be worth adding at this point? Uh, yes. Well, uh, first of all, just for the record, it was the reporting of Andrew Desiderio for Politico, his tweet last night that gave me the information. It was then breaking news. Schiff transmits new evidence to Nadler that will be included as part of the official record handed to the Senate for the impeachment trial. And well, I guess we'll see them handing it to them on C-SPAN later this week. Disclosure includes documents produced by Lev Parnas. There's a letter here. I don't know that it's actually worth reading, but it's the cover letter from Schiff to Nadler. And I guess we're awaiting information, and I guess it might be starting soon. I can't recall whether the word was that the uh, press availability from the speaker was coming at 10 or 10.30, but I guess the announcement of the names of the managers. Oh, yeah, here we are. CNN reporting Pelosi to announce impeachment managers Wednesday morning, um, 10 a.m. So, I don't know. We'll see how prompt she is. Maybe she's already doing it. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi plans now, I guess, to unveil the list of House Democrats who will serve as impeachment managers in the Senate trial. Um, it doesn't matter a great deal, really, at this point, who those people are. It's of some interest. Uh, and it's expected that uh, Schiff and Nadler will be among them. Um, probably a few other names that have been mentioned along the way. Um, likely, uh, all likely suspects, I guess. Um, no real reason to believe that Justin Amish will necessarily be among them. But like I said, I have mixed feelings about that. I could go either way on that. Um, not much information in this piece either about who else is likely to be named. But let's just make sure that that's, I think that's actually one of the articles that uh, Greg brought us. So we'll uh, mark it and make sure it's available for us to uh, to review later on. Okay, let's see. Uh, it, it, just another interesting tidbit in the news, getting some discussion at the moment, and I'm not certain what to make of it, but Jim Scuto uh, circulating this news, uh, one of the CNN reporters and anchors, breaking Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, remember him, he used to be the president of Russia when and he switched positions with Putin. Russian PM Dmitry Medvedev announced that he and the entire Russian government is to resign in a televised statement on Russian state TV. Hmm, that seems weird, don't you think? President Vladimir Putin thanked members, but added that not everything worked out. I don't really know how the hell we're supposed to take that one exactly, but uh, something strange is afoot, and all I can do is uh, say we're going to note that for the record and uh, see if further developments warrant uh, further discussion. I mean, the whole Russian government, you know how it is in these parliamentary democracies when they say, you know, they're going to resign. It's uh, they're going to have some elections. I don't know what they think they're going to do there. And they have mock elections there in Russia. So I, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to believe that Medvedev and the current Russian government haven't been compliant enough with the demands of Vladimir Putin. But uh, you never know. Not an expert in internal Russian politics, if that's even what it is. All right. So, uh, yeah, I guess we have that to watch as well. Um, 
before we then move on to pick our way through the rest of what I've got put aside on this story, um, one other tweet that might be sort of out of order or, or random, but I saw from, uh, again, one of our usual suspects. It's uh, New York City, NYC Southpaw again. The lead of the Washington Post's story, and I guess we'll probably eventually get to that one, gets at something that I think is pretty key. And he's got usually pretty good observations about what he thinks is key. The Parnas texts released last night suggest that the removal of Ambassador Yovanovitch was what Lutsenko, the Ukrainian prosecutor, was trading his concocted allegations against Biden for. For some reason, Lutsenko wanted very badly to see Yovanovitch out too. And it's still not entirely understood why the why Parnas and Fruman and Giuliani and then Pete Sessions and Donald Trump, etc., wanted Yovanovitch gone, especially considering how easy it should have been to actually just remove her. The, the, the purported president of the United States can just make that decision at the drop of a hat and get it done. Of course, this president is having considerable problems doing that because he's got people in the White House who are in the habit of ignoring his orders when they think it'll get him in legal trouble, and they just don't do these things. And we read earlier about uh, the struggle, the disbelief, really, that Trump had. Why I keep, I'm the president. I keep saying I want her gone, and she's not gone. Why is this not the case? And I guess there, are still, there were still people at the White House at the time saying, well, we have to go through a certain process in order to have sufficient cover that people don't start to probe why you did this. You do have that right to remove her at the drop of a hat, but the people also have the right elsewhere to ask you why that was done and try to construct theories as to why it might have been. And our guess is that they're going to construct theories that are damaging to our interests. If we go through this process, we can at least cast doubt on whatever theories they cook up. We're just better off legally and politically if you lay the groundwork for her dismissal first. Anyway, what seems uh, interesting here is <clears throat> up to now we've sort of speculated, well, they must want her gone for some reason. The reason must be that she herself was, you know, pretty dedicated to the actual anti-corruption fight in Ukraine the one to which uh, Joe Biden had dedicated himself on behalf of the United States government and all governments all over Western Europe, of course. Um, so it might just have been, we all sort of guessed, well, you know, she was, uh, you know, she's a, in a position of authority. She's a recognized authority on the country and the region. And she stood in position to perhaps uh, expose some of what we were trying to pull off, including, you know, cornering a section of the liquid natural gas market for ourselves or whatever else, you know, uh, pocketing bribes. No one was really sure what they were up to. It would certainly have been easier to do whatever it was that we didn't know about that they wanted to do in Ukraine with Yovanovitch out of the way or with a friendly ambassador willing to look the other way in her place. But it wasn't entirely clear that they couldn't get what they wanted, even with Yovanovitch in place. But now it turns out that Lutsenko, uh, for whatever reason, uh, he too thought that whatever it was he was up to would go easier without Yovanovitch in place. And that it was Lutsenko who was telling uh, Giuliani and Parnas and others that Jovanovic really had to go. And they needed something from Lutsenko. From Lutsenko, they wanted the dirt against Biden. Lutsenko said it would be easier to give them the dirt on Biden if Jovanovic was gone. So fine, that's it. All the, that's all the justification you need. Now, the removal of Jovanovic doesn't really necessarily have to have any direct benefit on the operations that Parnas and Fruman and Giuliani and Sessions and others we're hoping to pull off. All they care about is they're going to do a favor for Lutsenko. It's a quid pro quo for Lutsenko. 
we'll get rid of Jovanovic because that's within our power, and you will either get or manufacture the dirt on Biden because that's within your power. How can you manufacture dirt on Biden? Well, he's still the chief prosecutor in Ukraine. How can he be sure that his dirt will work? He can't, but he can be surer that it will work if witnesses who would be able to uh, testify to the unlikely nature of the proof he was supposedly producing about Biden's activity, either Biden's activity in Ukraine, uh, could be undermined by Marie Yovanovitch, who knew what she was talking about, had been there the whole time, and was a trusted voice on Ukrainian corruption fighting efforts. If we were to get rid of her and replace her with a U.S. ambassador who would say, yep, Burisma's rotten, and so is Hunter Biden, things would go a lot better. So why don't we all get... It's in everybody's interest. But Lutsenko was specifically requesting it. That's very interesting. So that is Southpaw's read of the Washington Post report under this headline, Ukraine prosecutor offered information related to Biden in exchange for Ambassador's ouster, newly released materials show. In exchange for, brings us to the mind of a uh, quid pro quo situation. Paul Son, Rosalind Hel uh, Helderman, is it Helderman or Heiderman? Uh, bringing it up here, uh, Helderman, sorry. And Tom Hamburger reporting this yesterday, 9 p.m., okay, so late in the evening. New materials released by House Democrats appear to show Ukraine's top prosecutor offering an associate of President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Kaludi Giuliani, damaging information related to former Vice President Joe Biden if, if, as in quid pro quo, if the Trump administration recalled the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. The text messages and documents provided to Congress by former Giuliani associate Lev Parnas also show that before the ambassador, Yovanovitch, was removed from her post, a Parnas associate now running for Congress sent menacing text messages suggesting that he had Yovanovitch under surveillance in Ukraine. A lawyer for Yovanovitch said Tuesday that the episode should be investigated, right? We've heard that. The cache of materials released by House investigators late Tuesday exposed a number of previously unknown details about efforts by Giuliani and his associates to obtain material in Ukraine that would undermine Trump's Democratic opponents. Their emergence on the eve of the Senate impeachment trial spurred Democrats to renew calls for the White House to turn over documents related to the Ukraine pressure campaign that it has refused to share with Congress. Among the revelations in the documents released Tuesday, a message from Giuliani to Parnas saying he had involved a person he called... No one, like number one, N-O. Number one, possibly Trump himself, in an effort to lift a U.S. visa ban on a former Ukrainian prosecutor, the one from before Lutsenko, who was planning to come to the United States to make claims about Biden. The materials also included a letter Giuliani wrote to Ukraine's then-president-elect, Zelensky, requesting a May 14th meeting with the new leader in Giuliani's, quote, capacity as personal counsel to President Trump and with his knowledge and consent. Giuliani scrapped his planned trip and the meeting never took place. But just once again, uh, interesting that in his letter, he thinks he's being honest and forthright by clarifying that he's there as Trump's personal lawyer. I took a look at the letter yesterday. It was being circulated. He's very careful in saying, I'm his personal lawyer, uh, not a representative of the United States government. And he goes on to say that this is a very common arrangement. Uh, I mean, it's common that presidents retain personal lawyers. It's just not that common that they dispatch them to foreign countries to handle sensitive uh, intelligence matters. But uh, whatever, uh, he's purposely conflating all of that. Uh, which brings us back to a point that I had made some time ago. Uh, thank you very much, Rudy Kaludi Giuliani, for providing this one. And uh, this should help in the impeachment trial. If you are sending your personal attorney in his capacity as your personal attorney, then you are in pursuit of personal benefit from that. And if you're in pursuit of personal benefit from foreign governments within uh, with whom you are uh, engaged in all sorts of sensitive operations... Uh, you have a problem. Personal lawyer, personal benefit. I mean, case closed. You want to know if there was a quid pro quo for the personal benefit of Donald Trump? The answer is yep. That's why he sent his personal attorney. The end. 
that actually should be a huge part of the case. Another document released by House investigators appears to show Parnas directly involved in efforts to get Zelensky to announce investigations related to Biden. There are these very goofy handwritten notes that are discussed next. Uh, on pieces of stationery from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Vienna, Parnas wrote, Get Zelensky, which apparently he spelled wrong, to announce, which he spelled wrong, that Biden case will be investigated. Also, by the way, with some weird capitalization going on here, much the same as Donald Trump does. I don't know if it's an imitation of Trump or whether Trump miscapitalizes things in imitation of some sort of idiosyncratic uh, capitalization problems that might be endemic to uh, people who's, uh, for whom English is a second language to Russian or Ukrainian or some Cyrillic uh, lettered tongue, or whether it's all just coincidence, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I guess we should also point out, you know, we don't know whether this is really Ritz-Carlton Hotel stuff or not. We don't know when it was written. It's not dated or anything. But And I, I, I don't know whether the handwritten notes are handed over or whether pictures of the handwritten notes were handed over. Uh, but I guess uh, in the evidentiary hearing, you would have all these questions asked if this was a criminal trial, which it's not. All of this new evidence confirms what we already know. The president and his associates pressured Ukrainian officials to announce investigations that would benefit the president politically. The chairs of the House Intelligence, Oversight, Judiciary and Foreign Affairs Committees said in a joint statement, there cannot be a full and fair trial in the Senate without the documents that President Trump is refusing to provide to Congress. Giuliani did not respond to requests for comment. Uh, same from the White House. The materials show that Parnas, a Russian speaker who helped coordinate Giuliani's outreach to Ukrainian sources, was directly communicating with an array of top Ukrainian officials. Among them was Yuri Lutsenko, at the time Ukraine's top prosecutor and a close ally of then-Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, who was running for re-election. Lutsenko wanted to get rid of Yovanovitch, in part because she had been critical of his office and supported a quasi-independent anti-corruption bureau he despised. The messages, written in Russian, show Lutsenko urging Parnas to force out Yovanovitch in exchange for cooperation regarding Biden. At one point, Lutsenko suggests he won't make any helpful public statements unless Madam Yo uh, uh, Yovanovitch is removed. So, quid pro quo, right there. It's just that if you don't make a decision about Madam, you are calling into question all my declarations, including about B. I-D-E-N, in case you were wondering what that means. Lutsenko wrote to Parnas in a March 22 message on WhatsApp. It's unclear if B is a reference to Biden or Burisma. Oh, that could be. The Ukrainian gas company on whose board Hunter Biden served from 2014 to 2019. Four days later, Lutsenko told Parnas that work on the case against the owner of the gas company is proceeding successfully and evidence of the money transfers of B had been obtained. And here you can't even remove one fool, Lutsenko laments, using a sad face emoticon as he again appeared to push for Yovanovitch's ouster. She's not a simple fool, trust me, Parnas responded, but she's not getting away. Parnas, days later, told Lutsenko that soon everything will turn around and will be on the right course. Lutsenko responded that he has copies of payments Burisma made to the investment firm co-founded by Biden's son, Hunter. Hmm. The following month, Yovanovitch was removed from her post at Giuliani's urging. Lutsenko later said publicly that he found no evidence of wrongdoing under Ukrainian law by Hunter or Joe Biden. A spokeswoman for Lutsenko did not respond to a message requesting comment. The new documents also introduced a new character into the drama over amb the ambassador's ouster. Uh, that would be uh, Hyde, of course. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Here are some of the other messages uh, found to be coming from Hyde that we haven't talked about yet. Wow, can't believe he means Trump here, but he typed Trumo, <laughs> T-R-U-M-O, can't believe Trump hasn't fired this B dash dash dash. He actually dashes out the B word, which is not Burisma or Biden in this case. But that's what he's uh, 
saying uh, Hyde wrote an, an encrypted message to Parnas on March 23rd. I'll get right on that. I'm not sure whether that's Parnas or <clears throat> Hyde speaking on the. I'll get right on that. Hyde described having contact with a private security team located near the embassy that was apparently monitoring the ambassador's movements. She's talked to three people. Her phone is off. Computer is off, he wrote in one message. And then there's the whole let me, they'll let me know when she's on the move bit. Uh, they're willing to help if we would like a price. Mm. Hyde did not explain how his team might help Parnas, who only responded with an LOL. When asked for comment by the Washington Post in a text message, Hyde replied, sorry, I can't talk right now. In a statement, Joseph A. Bondi, lawyer for Parnas, said there is no evidence that Mr. Parnas participated, agreed, paid money, or took any steps in furtherance of Mr. Hyde's proposals. He just listened politely. Hyde is one of three Republicans running to unseat the Democrat in the 5th Congressional District in Connecticut. He frequently tweets about his support for Trump and posted photos of himself with the president. Lawrence S. Robbins, a Yovanovitch attorney, said in a statement, needless to say, the notion that American citizens and others were monitoring the ambassador's movements for unknown reasons, purposes, is disturbing. We trust that the appropriate authorities will conduct an investigation to determine what happened. During his July 25th phone call with Zelensky, Trump de denigrated Yovanovitch and, of course, said, well, she's going to go through some things. Very interesting in light of that. I mean, it may or may not have had anything to do with that or had anything to do with any knowledge of the fact that that monitoring had happened. But it sure looks like it. And it could be coincidence and extremely bad luck. But what can I tell you? The president is stupid and keeps putting his foot in his mouth. And if it were to land him in criminal trouble at some point, I wouldn't be unhappy about that. The newly released documents also detail Giuliani's involvement in trying to secure a U.S. visa for Lutsenko's predecessor, Viktor Shokin, who has alleged that Biden asked Poroshenko to fire him because he was investigating the owner of Burisma at the time. Biden has denied the allegation, saying he pushed for Shokin's firing as part of a U.S. anti-corruption policy toward Ukraine. You know all this story. Shokin was fired after Biden's urging in March of 2016. Parnas was hoping to bring Shokin to the United States to meet with Giuliani and record his claims against Biden, but the U.S. Embassy, then run by Yovanovitch, had blocked Shokin's visa. There's real reason to get rid of her uh, on their own account. In January of last year, Parnas texted Giuliani to say the embassy had denied the visa. I can revive it, Giuliani replied. Days later, after the visa still hadn't come through, because Giuliani is a boob and has nothing to do with getting things done in America or elsewhere, Giuliani assured Parnas, it's going to work. I have number one in it, in, sick, or meaning on, I guess. It's going to work. I have number one on it. That would probably be Trump. It didn't work. Shokin didn't receive a visa. Instead, he gave a statement to Giuliani over the phone, which was always an option available to them. The trove of documents also appears to include Giuliani's first formal outreach to Zelensky. On May 10th, he wrote to the president-elect personally, identifying himself as Trump's private lawyer and asking for a meeting at which he would be accompanied by Victoria Tensing, a Washington lawyer who assisted Giuliani in the early phases of the Biden-related inquiry and who also was uh, striving to represent Dimitro Firtash in his suits against or his uh, his uh, filings against the United States government to avoid extradition here on bribery charges. The missive came after Parnas made overtures to an array of top Ukrainian officials, including Ivan Bakanov, a close aide to Zelensky, who is now head of Ukraine's intelligence agency in an effort to secure cooperation from the new Ukrainian leadership. At one point, Parnas expressed frustration that the connection had not been established. Please let me know what's happening and why we have not been able to do the call yet, he wrote. It's because you're criminals. That's the probable answer. On May 9th, Parnas sent Bakanov a New York Times article that described Giuliani's agenda for a planned trip to Ukraine, including the former New York mayor's interest in investigating the Biden family, Giuliani later scrapped the trip, telling Fox News he was convinced Zelensky was surrounded by enemies of Trump and enemies of the United States. And I guess he was going to get to the bottom of it. So, all right. Uh, also interesting and 
uh, valuable details to be included in all of this. Uh, we've got our third break coming up here and here's the music to announce it and i know that because i pressed the button on it uh this is going to take up the rest of the day it just really is these are some fascinating developments um i i guess you should keep in mind in all of this uh well like uh it's true what greg was warning about the likelihood of this just either absolutely derailing the impeachment or changing the direction or the outcome even of what happens in the impeachment is minimal, but uh, groundbreaking stuff nonetheless and more to come. Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue diving into the swamp here. Um, I have here, uh, I guess, by way of transition to a slightly different angle on all of this, the tweet from uh, Mitchell Hirsch, who lets us know uh, about another picture that's floating out there. And there are an awful lot of them. Uh, and maybe I ought to go through some of them, too. Here's one with Robert Finley Hyde. That's the F in, in, in uh, Robert F. Hyde. And weird Trump donor Cheng uh, Tsultrim Gao, for whom I guess he was doing PR slash lobbying work. I don't know. Here's the story. Uh, and a picture accompanying it from Mother Jones again. Um, I think I've already got this one. Yes, I do. So, uh, good. Let's read through it. Uh, also, uh, is this Daniel? Uh, yeah, okay. David Korn's in on this one, too, along with Daniel Shulman and Russ Shoma. Meet a most improbable Trump mega donor, a vegan Buddhist artist. That's how he's describing it, and that's in the quotes. A vegan Buddhist artist. Vegans outside the quotes from China. This just doesn't add up is the subheader on this. And it really probably doesn't. On October 12th, 2016, Cheng Gao, a recent immigrant from China, uh, which would make him probably a non-citizen, right? Donated $50,000 to Trump Victory, the joint fundraising committee for Donald Trump's presidential campaign and the Republican National Committee. It was the first in a series of big dollar contributions from Gao to Trump and the Republican Party that eventually would total $237,000, according to an analysis by the Center for Responsive Politics. The disclosure form filed by Trump Victory for this contribution listed an unusual occupation for Gao, Buddhist artist. I'm sure there are such things. Gao, 38 years old, does not fit the profile of the typical Trump mega donor. No, he doesn't. Hailing from Beijing, he is a heavily tattooed vegan and an advocate of Tibetan Buddhism who recoils at harming insects and who reveres the Dalai Lama. Gao's Instagram account, which appears under a Tibetan name he uses, Sultrim Pelgi, I don't know how good my pronunciation of Tibetan names is, reflects his spiritual sensibilities, his passion for art and design, and a jet-setting lifestyle. That does seem weird, doesn't it? May peace prevail on Earth, he comments in a recent post. In another, he is pictured with Nicole Kidman at the Hollywood Film Festival, or rather, Hollywood Film Awards party, because why not, right? Posts chronicle him traveling around the world. Kathmandu, certainly a possibility for a Tibetan, right? Disneyland, well, why not? Beverly Hills, sure. New Delhi, Kyoto, Doha. Hmm, getting his latest tattoo. Sultrim is inked across his knuckles. Viewing art in prominent museums. Sitting behind the wheel of a Rolls Royce. Visiting Buddhist monasteries. Attending New York Fashion Week. 
and watching an ultimate fighting championship bout at Madison Square Garden. Fighting is meditation, he observes in one post. Uh, look, I can't dispute it. I don't know anything about Tibetan Buddhism. Maybe it is. But it is a weird mix of places to be, especially um, one that's weird in that it coincides with places that people in the Donald Trump orbit were likely to be at all times. But, oh, you know, weird. I don't know. Gao, who made his Instagram account private on Friday after inquiries from Mother Jones. What's the date on this article, by the way? Uh, the article's from March of 2019, right around the time that Finley, who I guess now works for Gao in some capacity or claims to, was monitoring the whereabouts of Marie Yovanovitch in Kiev. But okay. So all of this is going on, you know, it was being reported in March of 2019. So where did I leave off? Uh, he made his Instagram account private on Friday, so that would have been back in March of last year, after inquiries from Mother Jones. Also posted photos of a more political nature in his Instagram account, his name card and menu at an exclusive January 2017 inauguration gala for major Trump donors held at the Library of Congress, with incoming Trump cabinet members. Packages that included admission to the dinner started at $100,000. In November 2018, holiday reception at the White House, hosted by Donald and Melania Trump, and multiple visits to Mar-a-Lago, Trump's private Palm Beach club, where he's meeting with sketchy Chinese immigrants all the time. One photo gives the impression that when Gao visited Mar-a-Lago in January, he rode aboard a Trump Organization helicopter. Gao also posted a photo of Trump Tower, where he and his wife, uh, King, uh, ready, Queen King Kui, that was my best guess, it's Q-I-N-G, Q-I-N-G, Queen Queen or King King, Kui, or Kui, Q-I-U, moved into an apartment a few months after Trump's inauguration. He's just an odd guy. He's just weirdly moving into the United States uh, as a recent immigrant, giving thousands of dollars. No indication here that he's not a U.S. citizen, though. I mean, you would have thought that they would have said so, but maybe maybe he is. Moves into Trump Tower. He's a Mar-a-Lago member. He's on the Trump Organization helicopters. He's giving hundreds of thousand dollars. He's a Buddhist artist and won't harm bugs. Uh, I don't know. He's at this uh, inauguration dinner. What's on the menu? I don't know. Uh, is there anything vegan friendly? It may just be that he went hungry at this thing. It doesn't necessarily mean he's a, a hypocritical vegan. We don't know. It's unclear how Gao amassed the wealth fueling his lifestyle and six-figure political giving. His donations extend beyond politics. He has contributed to the Rubin Museum in New York City, which focuses on Tibetan art, makes a little more sense, providing support for several exhibits. In one case, he donated $25,000 to underwrite an exhibition featuring rare Tibetan images, according to a former curator at the museum. Campaign finance records note Gao is affiliated with a business called Dharma Joy Arts and Culture. Gao founded the Beijing-based company in 2012, according to Chinese corporate records. In 2015, shortly after relocating to Manhattan from Beijing, he incorporated a firm by that name in New York State. A LinkedIn page describes Dharma Joy as, quote, an innovative lifestyle and fashion design firm that integrates the essence of oriental wisdom into modern arts and design. Sure, why not? Dharma Joy does not seem to have a website in the United States, and there appears to be little sign of the Internet on the Internet of it conducting any major business. Friends and associates of Gao who asked not to be identified say that Gao and Qi had a boutique in Beijing under this name. In 2014, this business sponsored an art installation in downtown Beijing at a venue called the Sultrim Art Space. So he may very well be involved in all this stuff. We just don't know where the money is coming from. Gao and Q, uh, according to several Gao associates, have said they own a business called Regal Aesthetic, a skincare company. All these people have multiple businesses, too, <clears throat> and not often related in any obvious way to one another. I find that interesting. They just say, well, we're serial entrepreneurs. I say it's cover, but okay. Chinese speakers asked by Mother Jones to search for records on Dharma Joy and Regal Aesthetic 
found scant documentation of significant business activity in China by either company. According to corporate records in Hong Kong, a company named Regal Aesthetic Medical Limited, Medical, was registered there uh, in May 2018. It's not clear whether Gao or Q, um, it's my best explana- uh, attempt at pronouncing Q-I-U, who are not listed as directors of the company on these records, have any connection to this business, which operates a beauty salon in the Kowloon section of Hong Kong that provides laser skin treatments and facials. A Mother Jones search located no public records indicating that Regal Aesthetic was conducting business in the United States. Business in China is weird, I must say, and people get... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm just thinking even here of Ivanka Trump and the strange trademarks and uh, copyright protections that she's sought out there for businesses that no one has ever even alleged that the Trump family is in. I just find that weird. Like, so it's, we have a skincare product, but we do laser. Well, what I mean is laser skin treatments and facials, but also medical. I don't know. It's all very weird. It could all be just <clears throat> different descriptions of the same activity, <clears throat> possibly. Uh, Q, the wife here, who graduated from New York University in 2009 with a degree in urban design and architecture studies, listed her most recent job as the deputy director of the China Intangible Cultural Heritage Fund, okay, on her LinkedIn profile, which was disabled after Mother Jones contacted her and Gao. Okay, um, I don't want to cast dispersions here, but by the way, if you have a degree in urban design and architecture studies and agree to live in Trump Tower, something's wrong with you. I'm just putting that one out there. Anyway... Uh, so let's see. Her website was down after she was contacted by uh, Mother Jones. Registered under China's Ministry of Culture, the fund aims to protect Chinese cultural practices, particularly folk culture. From 2007 to 2012, Q worked for the Center for Social Innovation at the China Social Entrepreneur Foundation, an organization founded by her well-connected mother, Wang Ping and Chinese business leaders and senior government officials. According to an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, Wang, I guess the mother here, started her career in academia, earning a master's degree in politics from the University of Maryland and serving as a visiting scholar at the European Union's Agricultural Division and then held a position in the International Department of the Chinese Communist Party at the Hong Kong investment and brokerage firm BNP Paribas Peregrine and at the Beijing office of the law firm Cha and Cha. I don't know anything about them. The mission of the International Department of Chinese Com- China's Communist Party has been described by experts as cultivating ties with communist parties abroad, developing connections with think tanks and non-governmental organizations, monitoring overseas political developments, and promoting Chinese influence in the West. Okay, no mystery there. Uh, one online bio for Q notes, King King is a realistic idealist. She believes that the cross-boundary understandings and collaboration of arts, philosophy, science, technology, economy, and other areas can result in remarkable strength and power. She hopes that everyone who wishes to improve the world through innovations could realize their dreams. Uh heady stuff. And you can't tell here whether it's being artistically weird or just bad English-Chinese translation weird or what. What accounts for the generosity of Gao, a Dalai Lama-loving vegan aesthete who, when uh, when it comes to Trump, uh, who has exploited fears of immigration and who behaves in a rather non-Buddhist manner? Well, Gao is extremely pro-life, you see, a friend of his said. Every now and then you get a person who grabs onto a politician for one policy, right? That, that's true. It's a good point. But this person adds that Gao is a complicated man and his support for Trump is a very big mystery to me. Even the people closest to him can't understand. Another person who knows Gao and Qi says, this just doesn't add up. The friend notes that Gao was persecuted in Beijing and placed under government surveillance, presumably for supporting Tibet and its spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, 
Sounds like the kind of person they would say, go to America, go be free and uh, give money to the American president. Uh, but they might be interested in monitoring what happens afterwards. But uh, some punishment, right? You're being persecuted. And then they say, you know what, go live in Trump Tower. I mean, that is a rather disgusting place to be, but uh, still better than being persecuted in Beijing, I would think. The uh, Let's see. So the friend notes that he was persecuted in Beijing, placed under government surveillance, China seized Tibet, of course, in 1950 and continues to rule it as an autonomous province, and Beijing views the exiled Dalai Lama as a major political threat. Gao's friends suggested that Gao, with his Trump Tower address and visits to the White House and Mar-a-Lago, might have been trying to impress Chinese business contacts. That sounds like a familiar pattern, right? He's a business person. What he's doing has to do with his business. It's not a shady thing. In China, connections, even superficial proximity to power, is a potent form of social and business currency. Chinese speakers have a word for this. Not that I can pronounce it, but it's anglicized here as guanzi. Uh, G-U-A-N-X-I, which I think uh, I'm, I'm assured the X is just a... Was that the one that's a Xi? Or, or the, I can't remember whether that's guanxi or guanji, guanzi. Dang, I can never remember. i got to consult on this. Anyway, as a vocal supporter of Tibet and the Dalai Lama, Gao would presumably have had difficulty doing significant business in China. He's very anti-China right now, his friend says. I wonder if the... I'm, I'm brought to mind... There's a, definitely one other Chinese national who was on the outs, allegedly, with the government, also living in Trump Tower, but who seemed to be a fugitive of some kind from the Chinese authorities, and I don't think it was this guy. Uh, I'm going to have to check back in my uh, records here and I'll give myself a note on Chinese Trump Tower residents, uh, besides the Bank of China, of course, which rents space down uh, street level or fifth floor or something like that, down where the commercial interests are. Anyway... Let's just read on. This is, looks like an awfully long article. I don't know how much more we're going to be able to get through here or what we're learning exactly, except somewhere along the line, I guess, before we lose this thread, we should point out that, um, let's see, one of the things that I have in pocket somewhere, I think, is uh, photo evidence uh, shared by Hyde at some point with others of his connection to Gao and pictures that seem to suggest that it was Hyde who was responsible for bringing Gao in as a member at Mar-a-Lago, which is awfully weird too, all by itself. So we'll see whether we get to that at any point in this article. About four years ago, we continue, Gao and his wife moved to New York from Beijing with an infant child, eventually settling in a rented loft on West 25th Street in the spring of 2015. Gao spoke little English at the time. It didn't seem like they were rolling in dough, a Gao acquaintance said. I was not really sure what he did, a designer or sculptor or what. No one's sure what anybody around Trump does, apparently. For much of the 2016 presidential election, Gao did not participate in the contest as a donor, and yet in the final weeks of the race, he began cutting large checks to the Trump campaign and the Republican National Committee. In mid-October, he made his $50,000 donation to the Trump Victory Committee, and he would continue to send hefty amounts to Trump and the RNC. He donated $30,000 to Trump's inaugural committee, where all the really dirty donors go, until March 28, 2018, the date of his most recent contribution. By this time, his donations had reached nearly a quarter million dollars. It is legal for green card holders, thank you, we're finally clearing this up, that is, foreigners who have permanent residence status to donate to U.S. political candidates and committees. Foreign nationals who have not obtained this status are prohibited from giving money to candidates. Of course, we did learn some time ago that for, uh, what was it, $500,000, if you invested uh, half a million dollars in Kushner's companies, they'd get you that green card. Hmm. There may or may not be that connection here. Just sort of pointing that out. Gao and Qi, or Q did not respond to repeated emails and phone messages. Amazing. From Mother Jones requesting comment. In response to the initial requests, 
a Republican lobbyist contacted Mother Jones and identified herself as a friend of Gao and Q and asked to have an off-the-record conversation. Subsequently, Mother Jones was informed that a public relations company would soon respond regarding the inquiries about Gao and Q, but no PR firm ever did so. Mother Jones then sent Gao and Q a long list of detailed questions that included queries about Gao's reasons for donating to Trump, his trips to the White House in Mar-a-Lago, his businesses, his immigration status, uh, what, uh, what's up with this green card? Do you have it? And if so, where'd you get it? Uh, and Q's work for those Chinese organizations, Gao and Q did not respond. At one point, Q inadvertently sent Mother Jones an email meant for the Republican lobbyist. In this brief note, Q asked, any news with green card and Air National Guard? Oh, that is an interesting question. Subsequently, Mother Jones asked if Q was referring to her husband's immigration status. Neither she nor the lobbyist responded to that one. An RNC official told Mother Jones in an email, in order for anyone to donate to Trump victory or the RNC, he or she must provide information showing they are eligible to contribute, as Mr. Gao did. Now, that's an ambiguous statement right there. Uh, you must show information, as Mr. Gao did, or does that mean... You have to, uh, um, uh, in order for anyone to donate, as Mr. Gao did, he must provide information. But did they really? We don't know. Uh, it's kind of ambiguous. It doesn't exactly say that he did show that information. It just means that he must show that information. That applied to him. He didn't do it, but it did apply to him. That's all. Gao's Instagram feed, which he started in May of 2016, has 87,000 followers, many of whom appear not to be genuine, according to two analytics companies. Hype Auditor estimated that a little over 50% of his followers are real. IG Audit said that about 20% were legitimate. Several people who knew Gao and Kui before he started posting to Instagram say they are considered the couple generally... Uh, the, or rather, they considered the couple generally reserved people and devout Buddhists deeply interested in art. Gao, they said, usually wore black. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. Uh, I've seen no pictures of him in black, by the way, in any of these things. The Instagram feed combines Gao's affinity for Tibetan Buddhism, there are numerous photos of Tibetan art and inscriptions, with what might be considered an incongruous flashiness, like non-black wearing flashiness even, he features various tattoos and his visits to the Bang Bang Tattoo Parlor in New York City, which boasts top celebrities as its clientele. Tattoo is my life, he writes. That might explain it. And he chronicles his visits to gyms. Workout is my second faith. In one post, Gao shows off a pair of Mercedes G-Wagons, one with the license plate Sultrim. Another presents a photo of a $20,000 replica of a Kentucky Fried Chicken Zinger Sandwich. What? Carved from a meteorite? What? The priciest offering in the fast food company's online boutique. What? Hold on, I gotta figure that out. A picture of a $20,000 replica of a Kentucky Fried Chicken Zinger Sandwich. Carved from a meteorite. And that is a thing that is actually offered in Kentucky Fried Chicken's online boutique. And that is a thing that exists. Kentucky Fried Chicken's online boutique. I mean, it doesn't say he owns it, does it? No. It just... Well, let me read on because this is dumb too. Q apparently purchased, so she did, purchased the KFC sculpture anonymously for her husband in 2017. How do they know it was anonymously? I don't know. It's linked. Go read it. It is indeed a chicken sandwich out of the world. I think they mean this world. Gao wrote in the post, My love for KFC, especially the Zinger sandwich, go back a long way. For almost 10 years in my teens, I ate the Zinger burger every single day. It was my favorite. If you ask me something... I occasionally miss after becoming vegan, in case you were wondering about that. The KFC Zinger Burger would definitely, he misspells it, be one of them. I don't even know what to say. 
again, I guess it's a what am I doing in life question. Here's the picture. Eh, yeah. I mean, imagine getting a hold of a meteorite large enough to do this to and saying, eh, what we should do with this is carve a replica of a KFC Zinger sandwich out of it and, and sell it. So, like, I mean, it's not like KFC has on staff sculptors who are working in meteorite all the time. They must have had somebody, imagine this one, you know, proposes to them, you know, we could sell it for $20,000 in our online boutique. Wait a minute. Why do we have an online boutique? Oh, I didn't get to that uh, proposition yet. Wait, wait till you hear what I have. To, not only are we going to have an online boutique, we're going to sell $20,000 meteorite carved zinger sandwiches. Who's going to buy that? Chinese people, they love it. I don't know. I do not know. In the spring of 2017, Gao and his family left their loft in the Flatiron District and moved uptown and into Trump Tower. According to real estate records, their two-bedroom, 1,587-square-foot apartment was purchased for $3.75 million in May of 2016 by a limited liability corporation called Pure Regal International. It is registered in the British Virgin Islands. Remember, Regal? Hmm. Uh, the firm's owners are not disclosed on the corporate records for this company. The British Virgin Islands are a notorious tax haven. The mailing address for Pure Regal is the Tort. Tortola, is that right? Office of the Portcullis Group, which describes itself as one of the largest Asian independent wealth managers. That's it. No public records could be found linking Pure Regal International to Gao's Regal Aesthetic Company. The purchase of this apartment, previously owned by another LLC, because money laundering, would not have directly benefited Trump, who long ago sold most of his Trump Tower apartments, but whose company continues to manage the building. And maybe good kickbacks for all these weird LLC transactions. I don't know. There's more to the story. There's no way we're getting all the way through it. Um, and I did say that there was one other thing that I wanted to share with you, which was, uh, and I don't know whether I pocketed it and made it easy for myself or not, but the long, incredibly long list of people who uh, hide managed to get pictures with over the years and uh, tweet around his uh, collection. Is it in this here? I don't know. I think maybe, um, dang, might it have been Parker Malloy who was uh, sharing all these things in a more humorous way. But the Daily Beast has got a large collection of them uh, as well. In Will Sommer and Betsy Swan's piece, Meet the Trump Donor Who Allegedly Stalked America's Ambassador in Ukraine, uh, among the pictures here are Hyde with Trump at one of the golf clubs, humorously in front of a, uh, inadvertently, in front of a picture on the wall in the club of a younger Donald Trump looking sultry and handsome over his shoulder. Here's a shot of him with Eric Trump. Here's uh, uh, Hyde with Trump again, maybe at a White House event from the looks of things. Um yeah, but uh, there's a whole huge collection. Dang, I wish I had the uh, Parker Malloy uh, question or uh, collection alongside. I think I might have retweeted at least one of them. And I'll see if I can't scroll quickly enough through last night's pictures to get a hold of the chain that she put together before we finally have to exit for the day. But boy... Uh, Rather amazing. Yeah, here we go. I found the chain here. So here's one from uh, with, uh, who is this? And here is his Instagram thing. Congressman Hyde 2020 that he calls himself. Here's with Pete Hegseth from Fox and Friends. Uh, here's, I don't know who this, I think a Fox figure of some sort. Uh, Shannon Bream. Um, here's two with Charlie Kirk, the Turning Point USA kook. Uh, here's some with Eric Bowling, also a, uh, I think now ex Fox News and currently like uh, Glenn Beck Operation Kook as well. Uh, let's see, we'll read out a few more before we take our leave for the day. Here's some with Corey Lewandowski. Uh, all right, interesting. And a couple other participants in this. Who's, who's with him there? I can't tell. Corey Lewandowski is uh, the main feature there. Here's one with Rand Paul, Chris Christie, Mike Huckabee, Mike Flynn, the spy, the notorious spy, Matt Gates as well. There are two of them there. Here's one with Jim Jordan. And 
I note that uh, apparently, right, the day of the infamous Zelensky phone call was the day that Hyde found himself hanging out with Jim Jordan at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. There are a few others. Here's McCarthy. Here's Matt Schlapp. Uh, anybody else? Roger Stone, of course, with the cigars. Uh, here's one with Ivanka Trump. There's, uh, hmm, let's see, so many more as well uh, in this one. It's really rather remarkable. Ben Carson, it goes on and on. So I'll share that thread with you. And in the meantime, I'll share this information with you. It's time to hand the mic over, believe it or not. We could go on forever. Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. He's even covering different stories as well as this one. Uh, though this one, I think, might occupy a great deal of his time, too. But there's more. Uh, what else have we got? Hmm, let's see if we can squeeze this one in after this short message. Hang on. A little disorganized. It's okay. From Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Here we got one from more Florida men and what they're up to. The Florida GOP altered an anti-white supremacy bill after an anti-immigrant group said it is racist to whites. They're very sensitive to that. We got that much more, of course, from around the country and around the world coming up next on the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Next.